Well, I work at Rapid7. I am the engineering manager for Metasploit. So, uh, hey, if you ever want to contribute or work on Metasploit, I, talk to me afterwards and we can talk about that too. Uh, so yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I'm here to talk about LibreSSL. Um, whenever LibreSSL first came out, um, we had a couple of talks. One was after the first 30 days, another one was after the next 30 days. Um, there was one that came out about a year and a half ago. This might be the first talk we've ever had about LibreSSL that was in this country. Um, a lot of times we have things in Europe and uh, like uh, um, Asia BSD Con and things like that. So uh, this might actually be the first OpenBSD talk that's happened in Texas, which is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> yoo hoo wah -ha. All right, so um, I was really jealous of JDuck slides earlier um, because he had all this really cool JavaScript stuff going on, and so I had to, had to um, ape him. Um, so uh, sorry if I'm, I'm mimicking you there, but uh, I really think it's cool. So I, I converted all my slides this morning to uh, this cool framework. So anyway, what is LibreSSL? Well, LibreSSL, it's a two-year-old fork, obviously two years old, uh, or almost, um, of OpenSSL 101G. Um, it came right, out, right after the heartbeat plug Heartbleed bug <laughs> was discovered and, and released on, on April not, uh, 7th, I believe. Uh, and then the first commits that actually made it LibreSSL were on the 10th when Theo Durat said, screw this, we're going to turn off all this uh, crazy uh, heartbeat stuff that's in SSL and we're going to start bumping the versions and we're going to just take over the stuff and do our own audits. Um, the project was first unveiled to the world on April 22nd um, and uh, it came out with this really colorful logo here. Um, uh, can anyone guess what, who, who, that, who that logo is supposed to represent? No, actually, it's supposed to represent uh, King Ferdinand um, of uh, Aragon. He was the guy who uh, led the uh, investigation to the New World. He was the one who sort of financed Christopher Columbus and all those others. So, so uh, close. <laughs> anyway, um, so what does LibreSSL do for you? All right, so uh, LibreSSL being a fork means that usually when people create forks because they want some sort of feature or something that um, you know, the upstream isn't, isn't doing right. Um, LibreSelf has some interesting features. It has a lot of interesting new protocols. Um, it has like the Ghost cipher suite built in, which is a, uh, a Russian cipher suite. Uh, we're actually working on some Ukrainian um, cipher suites as well. So if you live in Russia or Ukraine or one of the Soviet bloc countries, it's really important to have these kinds of things built right into your SSL cipher suite. Um, it has uh, Cha Cha and, and Poly 1305, which are uh, D. Bernstein's um, brain children. Um, there have been patches floating around for open SSL for a while, but we went ahead and pulled them in. Also has the Brain Pool um, uh, elliptical curve sets, which are supposed to be completely foolproof and completely uh, untainted by government stuff. Uh, we may have to revisit that soon because it turns out that may not be as true as we hoped. But um, anyway, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> it, one thing about Libra Cells, it's always willing to remove things that uh, don't make any sense anymore. Um, and that's sort of something that we do sort of constantly, uh, much to the chagrin of some distribution maintainers. But, uh, but you know, it's all in the interest of, um, you know, making the world a better place. Um, it also has a new API for doing SSL. If you've ever done open SSL development, like uh, as a client or writing a server or something like that, you might find that the, the, the interface is a little, uh, a little weird, like, uh, you know, in, in the case of like, you know, one being a, a, a success and zero being a failure, and usually things are just very backwards and, and unwieldy in um, OpenSSL. We have an, an API called libtls, which allows um, you to basically program it in kind of a sane way. Um, it also doesn't really expose any of the underlying OpenSSL primitives, so you can program to libtls. One of our goals for the future is to actually get rid of the OpenSSL bits altogether and make it actually completely independent uh, as a BSD licensed um, uh, SSL library. Or actually, I should say a TLS library because libtls also doesn't even have SSL cell support anymore because we got rid of that. Um, also, it has in-memory privilege separation, which allows you to do things like loading a certificate without having access to the file system. Um, this is very useful for when you have, like, uh, say, something talked to the network that needs to be privilege separated, but you don't want to be able to talk to the file system. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, we even have TLS-enabled Netcat. Uh, so, ooh, that's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of white application support. Um, one nice thing about being a operating system rather than just a library developer is we have a team of ports guys that maintain over 9,000 different pieces of software. And um, they often either write patches or they push um, patches upstream into uh, all the packages that we use today um, and uh, basically help further on the, the software ecosystem. Um, I'm going to go down here and talk about some of the D features of LibreSSL as well. Um, we've gotten rid of a, a number of like network protocols, SSL v2, v3, DTLS09, which is only used by Cisco for um, OpenConnect type stuff. Um, we also got rid of SHA. Did you know we got rid of SHA? 
I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, FIPS support, um, SRP, which has uh, yielded a whole lot of great bugs ever since we got rid of it. Um, SCTP, uh, entry, entry gathering daemon, um, and then of course compression, which is like used for crime attacks. Um, OpenSSL 1.1 pre-4, I checked this morning, is uh, 433,000 lines of code, um, 200, almost 280,000 lines of ANSI C, and the latest version of LibreSSL portable. I'm trying to compare apples to apples here. Um, just, uh, just basically including the portable stuff too. It's a lot smaller if you get rid of all the portable goo. Um, is about 278,000 lines. Um, I'd like it to be a lot smaller. I know it's still uh, 218,000 lines of code is still uh, a lot to audit, and I'm sure Todd would really love to uh, use this tool to see if he ever gets done auditing all this code. Um, it'd be interesting to see. <laughs> Never. Um, so LibreSSL Portable, one of the goals is to make it uh, reasonably POSIX and, and uh, require that the OSs that we port it to are at least somewhat secure, um, meaning that a guy was working on an IREX port and we basically said, no, you know what, IREX just isn't going to work. There's no patches for it and you can't really get like good sources of entropy. Um, so we tried to try to be a little bit more judicious. We don't port to VAX and things of that nature. But still, we ended up with a ton of different platforms, um, AX, OSX, FreeBSD, HPUX, et cetera, et cetera, Solaris, even Windows. Um, and even on Windows, there's at least three different platforms, maybe four or five coming up soon, um, because Windows has lots of different ways to program it. Um, MinGW is one, which is kind of like someone between POSIX and uh, native Windows. You got Sigwin, which is kind of a weird POSIX simulation layer. And Visual Studio can actually build um, LibreSSL. Um, here are some OSs that actually use it, um, ship with it. Um, and uh, there's probably more on the way, and there's actually a, a quite a few number of like hobby OSs that, that use it as well. I, I, I know uh, Sortix, which is a, 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 a custom Unix system that was written by a single guy. He uses it. Um, MidiPix is another like new Windows um, translation layer that uses it. So it's kind of a nice tool in that it's nice to see people saying, I have a hard time porting OpenSSL. Uh, hey, LibreSSL is actually really easy to, to move into my OS as well. Uh, why did I get involved? One of the reasons is because I like building software like this. I don't like building software like this. Um, it is a pain in the butt to uh, configure OpenSSL, and it's never gotten any easier. Um, you have to turn off a bunch of features that are all sort of on by default. Um, you have to set a bunch of weird, obscure flags. You have to get rid of archaic flags that are stuck into uh, you know, the configured files and that kind of stuff. And even when you build things like static libraries are by default aren't, aren't built properly with OpenSSL. And it's just, just weird. You spend all day. It's just a non-standard and uh, heck, we don't need it. Um, why did I get involved with the project? Um, well, I, I like the idea of it just being secure by default. I like the idea of not having a whole bunch of knobs to turn to, to make it configure right. That's actually the open, one of the OpenBSD logos is knobs are for knobs. Um, I don't know why, but I like to hurt myself um, <laughs> when I work on these things. And basically, there were dares on the internet saying, oh, I don't think anyone will ever be able to get LibreSSL to build anything other than OpenBSD. So I decided to do it one evening and got it going. So origin tale, why did I even get started with OpenSSL in the first place? Why was I messing with it? So horror story number one, here's a breaking point 1000, break BPS 1K box. I have like a whole pile of these in my garage at home. Um, <laughs> and they all work, um, it's cool. Um, we should we should have like a BPS 1K party. We could like have like a club or something where we can uh, just like turn them all on and I don't know. Cars, yeah, like classic cars. Exactly. We should like like soup them up because they got that big grill on them. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, horror story number one. Um, we built this box and we didn't really have an idea that we would use SSL with it. And then uh, like maybe a year into it, uh, the the product manager was like, hey. Can we do open, oh, like SSL with these boxes? Can we like accelerate it? But it's a bunch of weird like in, in, uh, embedded CPUs and that kind of stuff. It's like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to fit this in? So me and another guy worked together. We worked for about six months trying to get OpenSSL to work. Um, basically, we found it was pretty much intractable and it's impossible to read. Um, we switched to a different SSL library and got it done in like two weeks. And uh, it's like, ah, I'm going to get you OpenSSL someday. Horror story number two. Um, well, uh, another company I worked with, that's where I worked at Boundary, um, not Boundary, at Breaking Point, was, uh, was, was Boundary, which is a little uh, startup out of San Francisco that built um, basically um, network monitoring, network flow monitoring software. Um, and uh, the reason why I've got this little heart up here, by the way, is there's an embedded Easter egg in their meter, um, and you guys could actually crack it and try to figure out how you make it sh uh, show the heart whenever you start it. Um, but uh, uh, basically, we had embedded OpenSSL into this as well, so that all the meters that were deployed everywhere on lots of companies like Netflix and different places, um, they had statically linked OpenSSL into it. So the day that Heartbleed came out, which uh, is kind of funny because we actually had a little heart um, beater inside of our meter, um, we had to do a lot of stuff and stay up late at night. And it's like, ah, I wish I, there was an alternative that didn't make me have to patch so often. 
So, um, about a month or two after um, I worked on the first port, just you know, threw it on GitHub and you know, saw what would happen, um, I started getting some emails from a, a Mr. Theo DeRat, um, and he was uh, basically just giving me patches. He didn't really say hi, he just kind of said, hey, can you change the code to be like this instead? I think it'll work better. And um, at the time, we were actually, uh, me and my family were visiting Japan, um, and, uh, and so everyone was jet lagged and, um, and you know, kind of out of it. So when everyone was sleeping, I would just go and hang out in this uh, Sakura Hotel Cafe with my little uh, Chromebook and, and hack on LibreSSL. Um, so that's actually how the very first version of LibreSSL came together, working with OpenBSD team, was me working in Japan and the guys you know, over in Canada and wherever else um, were just basically hacking together across the world. So it was kind of fun. Um, and then during this time, they basically asked, hey, can you like meet us in uh, Slovenia? We're gonna have like a meetup and like really like put this together and get like the first portable versions officially out. And so that was kind of a fun, fun discussion with my wife saying, hey, um, can I go like meet these random guys that I met on the internet and like um, kind of Eastern Europe and uh, you know, just you know, hang out with them for a week or two and like work on some code, like hack on things. And you know what, my wife's pretty cool. She said, oh yeah, sure, uh, you gotta pay for it though. So. Uh, so anyway, I had to sell some stuff. But uh, and <laughs> I went over there, and uh, it was awesome time. Uh, another funny thing was uh, trying to figure out how to get there. Um, when you go through customs, they ask you, like, why are you here? And you say, well, I guess I'm on am I on business? I don't know. I guess I'm, like, here to, like, meet friends. And, like, who are your friends? And, like, I know some, guys, some hackers I met on the Internet, and I'm going to, like, just meet them randomly. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of an awkward conversation. We get to that. So, uh, so Theo said, hey, "Hey, there's like a couple guys that you'll meet, um, like on the plane, and you should like, hang out with them." But he didn't say what they looked like, and I didn't have any pictures. So I was just like looking around the plane, like looking for like who looks like a hacker, who looks like an open beast guy. Um, I picked this couple out. I was totally wrong, and in the end, um, I think I was just uh, was on the completely wrong track. But a bunch of other guys saw me, and they're like, "We wonder if that's Brent." I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, this is actually a picture from the castle in the middle of Ljubljana, Slovenia, where we did the first um, LibreSSL portable release. And this is the picture I actually took with my phone. This is what it freaking looks like when you develop software in Europe. It is so awesome. And, and I'm, I, I can totally understand why they do it, do it in these different places. But uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance to check out Ljubljana, um, very cool place. But anyway, we hacked for a week. Um, there was a lot of um, orange-flavored beer drunk and uh, a lot of um, cursing um, to be had. But uh, we got it done. We got two or three releases out in that week, so it was cool. Um, and we continue to hack. Um, we've, we've gone to uh, Croatia, we've gone to Canada, we've gone to various places. I actually tried to set up a hackathon here in Austin, but uh, it's not really clear if um, due to upcoming crypto regulations in the United States, if that's actually something you want to try. Um, so that's kind of a, kind of a weird thing. Uh, okay, so you know, let's talk a little, a little about LibreSSL Portable. Um, that's actually the part that I work on. It's kind of an unusual role within the OpenBSD project because usually uh, most OpenBSD guys are kind of like screw portable and if it works with ROS, um, everyone else can just sort of, you know, you know, hit the pavement. But uh, I really think things have changed lately. Um, one thing to note about porting is that it's really easy to make things compile, but it's really hard to make things that just work properly. Um, even when you think your OS is actually doing the right thing, um, when you compare, like, say, how like OpenBSD implements a function to compare to the way another OS might implement a function, you might find that there's uh, some real, um, let's say, um, impedance mismatches there, or at least uh, m uh, mistakes in how people have implemented things. Um, but through the power of abstractions and not if defs, we've managed to make a lot of the uh, porting problems that a lot of uh, software, including OpenSSL, um, have had in the past kind of go away. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. Um, something that we've done that's kind of interesting is whenever we find an OS that has a weird bug, like I say, in the C library, it's kernel, whatever, we've been working with the maintainers of the operating systems themselves to fix their OSs rather than just working around it. Um, and I think that actually produces a better outcome because it actually improves a lot more software than just the software that we're porting. Um, okay, I've got a couple of nutshells. So uh, it's two halves of a nut, I guess it's a walnut. Um, so anyway, portable apps have traditionally been isolated from mainline, um, meaning if you like say go to the OpenSSH website, they talk about they have one team that builds the OpenSSL thing and then they throw that over the wall to the uh, portable team. Um, with LibreSSL, they decided to do it a little bit differently. Um, when I first started working on LibreSSL, I had about 120 different patches I had to apply in order to make it build on other operating systems. And they basically just accepted all those back into to LibreSSL. The idea here being, if there are fewer patches between portable and non-portable, then 
the code is more secure because everyone's sort of auditing it in the same place. It's not like you know, oh, this patch you know causes a problem. Like like say uh, when, when Debian did that patch that broke the uh, the random number generators and opened a cell. Um, you know, if you if you if you don't have the fewer patches you have, the more eyes you have. So that's really good. Um, basically, we target POSIX and C99. OpenBSD itself had a lot of POSIX compliance problems two years ago, and as a result of uh, just basically looking at the standard and finding the places where we're quirky, um, we're able to get actually OpenBSD a lot more compliant than it used to be. And, um, and so now, uh, basically, I think LibreCell has maybe like four or five patches, and they're mostly actually around Windows um, that uh, it needs in order to build. Um, there are a few extensions, um, sort of exceptions to the rule, things that aren't like literally in POSIX, but I think they're really good extensions to uh, a C library anyway. Um, and they're really pretty, some of them are pretty trivial functions, like explicit B0, realloc array, sterile cat, all things like that. Unfortunately, none of these things are in glibc. Um, so <laughs> it'd be really great if someday they were, but um, so far, no dice. Um, so wherever possible, um, when we have like a deficiency, like say glibc doesn't have something like sterile cat or sterile copy, we actually just um, automatically, as part of a build process, pull it from the OpenBSD um, C library. A lot of times people will write their own magical versions, but um, if there's like say an improvement upstream, you, you don't get it because uh, you, know, you end up with this embedded version. Part of our build process is that anytime there's a, there's a change in the C library upstream, like an OpenBSD or something like that, we, we can automatically pull it in. And if you look at our Git repository, you can sort of see how that works where there's literally an import of the OpenBSD source tree directly in, and there's some scripting magic that sort of glues them together. Um, also, um, interfaces like Arc for Random traditionally have required people to do a lot of like hackomatic changes into their local implementations. Um, because of that, you end up with a lot of really broken Arc for Random implementations out there in the world. Oh, by the way, Arc for Random is a function that's used to create basically secure um, random number streams um, and do it in a kind of an easy, reliable way where there actually isn't even a failure mode. Um, it either completely crashes your machine or it always works, and it pretty much always works. Um, so, in fact, the only way it can fail is to crash your machine, which is like something that theoretically should never happen. Um, so uh, it's something that where you can't sort of get a half measure where you're like, hmm, it looks like I, random, I forgot to seed my random number generator or I forgot or I seeded it wrong or just something like that. It's impossible with Arc4 Random. Um, but anyway, um, as a result of this project, we did a lot of work to make Arc4 Random more easily ported. As a result, there's actually C code for Windows in the OpenBSD source tree um, to, to just to make this stuff easier for people to find and see and, and use it. Um, so let's talk about one of the things that's just kind of interesting you'd think would be really simple. It's the idea of sanitizing memory before you hand it back to the operating system. Um, let's look at this code here for a second. So you say you get a buffer, you fill it with a secret, and then you memset it at the end. Your compiler will oftentimes, depending on what your optimization level, get rid of the final memset because it says, hey, it looks like no one is actually reading this after I set it. So obviously, I can just optimize out this, this function call because uh, it's doing nothing. Um, the compiler doesn't have a sense of security, like is this like have some sort of other use other than um, you know just wasting CPU cycles. Um, so uh, back in the good old days, uh, I don't know if you guys have used OpenBSD before, but it's actually got a kind of old compiler built into it. It's using GCC 4.2, which is the version that came out before they switched to GPL v3. And they're still using it to this day, and so it's like almost like 15 years old. I, I think it's it's kind of kind of kind of sad that that uh, that GPL v3 is kind of hurt GCC's uh, uh, deployment within a lot of places, but I'm kind of glad that Clang and, and all those things came out as a result of it. Um, but anyway, uh, this is what OpenBSD's explicit B0 function looks like, which is basically intended to um, always basically fix that problem where the compiler optimizes it out. Um, the problem here is that link time optimization with newer compilers does optimize it out because it says, oh, well, if I just unroll this after I link the compilation unit together, um, I find that, yeah, this isn't actually doing anything either, so I'll just go ahead and just get rid of it. So um, the OpenBSD didn't hit this problem, but when I did the portable changes, other OSs hit this problem. Um, so uh, from NetBSD, um, one of my first tries was look at, well, how does NetBSD do it? Maybe, maybe they're more portable. So they basically create a function pointer, a, a, vol a volatile function pointer to MemSet, and then um, dereference that in order to, uh, uh, to, to actually implement explicit v0. But the problem here is that now you've basically created a hookable function pointer that can be used um, and perhaps updated to, uh, you know, to, to, to basically get control, or it's a nice ROP gadget. Uh, just not really the best kind of secure interface for something that's always going to be handling secure um, memory. Um, OpenBSD did something a little bit different in 5.6 uh, to, to deal with this issue that where other compilers were, were basically having this issue. So rather than having a, a real um, a void pointer, we actually created, created a function that might get um, hooked at link time, maybe even during um, 
um, as sort of like a, a preload or something like that, where you basically have this weak function. A weak function means basically um, you can't ever resolve where the function will be until you've um, you know started the executable. Um, that's what we basically did, is basically stuck a, stuck a weak function in here. However, link time optimization, especially when you have a static binary, is still able to optimize this out. Um, so we had to do some more magic crap, um, where basically we created a special um, compatibility library that's marked with optimization, optimization zero. And this is enough to tell the, the, the linker, hey, you, this is unoptimized, you cannot optimize it, do not optimize it, and then that basically solves your problem. Um, in all the cases, um, but, um, there are some other ways that are supposedly officially sanctioned um, for, for doing the same kind of operation. For instance, C11 added something called MIMSET S, which is supposed to be the secure version of MIMSET, um, but it's actually really not implemented very many places. I, I know it's implemented on OS X, but like for instance, not implemented on Linux. And, in, and if you look at the, the arguments, um, take a look at that. So you have MIMSET, which takes a buffer, it takes what you want to set it to, and it takes a size. The secure version of MIMSET takes a buffer, uh, an S max, an int C, an R size T, an N. Uh, so I don't know, but uh, this seems kind of like something that people will get wrong a lot of times where you know, if you swap one to the other, you can create problems. Also note that MIMSET can't fail, but MIMSET S has an error node that it returns, and it actually has this whole series of constraints and violations that you have to check to see if you really set the memory or not, and uh, I, it just doesn't look like anything worth, worth following up with. Um, Interestingly enough, um, Windows is ahead of everybody in this area. Uh, they've had secure zero memory for years and years, and uh, th on the Windows port, this is all it actually does. Um, so hey, hooray for Windows. At least, because it's not open source, I can't tell that it's, it's any worse than anything else. So I guess we'll just keep it at its word. Um, here's another thing that we have to do a lot of times inside a crypto library. And that is, uh, well, I'll take it back. This is, this is, we're still talking about setting the memory. So the question is, how do we test that we've actually solved this problem? Um, if you write to the memory, if you don't read from it, then the compiler says, I'm gonna optimize it out. But if you read from it to test to see if the write was optimized out, then the compiler says, oh, you did read from it, and so I will not optimize it out. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of a pain in the butt to test. Uh, Matthew, Mat Matthew Dimsky, um, he actually works with Google, um, he, he, he basically wrote this test where he basically replaced the, um, the signal stack and then you put buffers on the stack when you, when you call a signal handler, and then you check to see if your stack um, ends up matching the buffer that you set as the stack. And you can then sort of, um, through sort of a side channel, tell if you have set the memory or not. It's kind of a clever, clever trick. Um, so here's kind of the status. I was gonna talk about, you know, basically from 2014 to today. Um, unfortunately, um, Ubuntu, um, glibc223, the, the, the long-term supported version, which is going to be around for another five years, doesn't have any of these secure interfaces. doesn't have explicit v0, um, explicit memset, which I'll talk about here in a second, and explicit uh, memset s. So it basically means for the next five years, we're still going to keep around um, backwards compatibility, portability things for, for like the latest um, and greatest Ubuntu, which is, I, I don't even think it's released yet. Um, uh, so looking back at NetBSD 7, what have they changed in the last two years? Um, they got rid of explicit B0. Um, they renamed it to explicit MIMSET instead. Um, so now you can, uh, you can make your, uh, your secure buffers all Fs or make them uh, Fe's or fives or something like that. So they really stand out whenever you look at memory. Um, I don't know if it's really that great of an idea, but hey, they, at least uh, you know, now you can securely set your memory to anything you want. All right, um, now let's talk about making new secrets. So before we were talking about getting rid of secret data, how do, you, how do you make a secret securely? How do you basically generate a random stream? This is very important whenever you have um, secure um, libraries, you wanna make sure that you can, um, you can generate random numbers in a secure way that you don't screw it up. Um, we've heard about all the times about people using bad seeds, not adding enough entropy, all this kind of stuff. Uh, this is the first thing that LibreSSL, one of the first things that LibreSSL did was they got rid of um, OpenSSL's random number generator stuff and basically just stuck ARC4 random in. The ARC4 random, the one that basically doesn't have an error uh, failure mode, it always works. Um, so, then, yeah, so we basically got rid of the C, got rid of the add. Um, yeah, nice. All right, so how do we do this portably? All right, so ARC4 random, it's been around 20 years. Um, well, uh, 1996, it really got released in OpenSSL 2.1, which was a, a two, two, nine, 1997, but, um, but hey, it's almost 20 years. Um, it's still not in Linux. What do we do? Um, 
Well, uh, whenever I was first doing the port, first thing I said was, hey, look, there's this libvsd thing out there. I'll just, just link that in. That's great. I did that, and uh, a guy then subsequently wrote a blog post called How, Not, How to Create Terrible Security Mistakes When You Port Lee versus Cell to Other Operating Systems, and it included my, uh, my, my mistake as, as like the prime example of like something idiotic to do. So anyway, um, here we go. Uh, this is actually literally the OpenBSD implementation from, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. And um, they made the same mistake as well. But hey, you know, um, security is a process. It's not just a, a, an, in, an endpoint. So, um, so the big problem with this is if you run out of file descriptors or someone accidentally closes your file descriptor in between, like because file descriptors are global between all threads, or if um, you know, the, the, there's a permissions problem or something like that, the fallback is read some crap off the stack and get time of day which is totally predictable. So um, there have actually, I've actually heard of attacks where you could basically force a server to go low on file descriptors via some other mechanism if you can sort of force something to happen that causes file descriptors to be low temporarily or permanently. Um, you, can, you, can, you then cause the random number generator to become uh, predictable or start be, being seeded with predictable data, which isn't good. Um, so anyway, that's crap. So next thing I thought was, well, OpenSSH must know how to do this, right? So I grabbed the OpenSSH code, and it turns out there was a circular dependency. OpenSSH was linking to OpenSSL to, to get the random number bytes to see if it's on internal random number generator. So obviously, that's not going to work. Um, next thing I did was uh, found a, uh, a, you know, an alternate random number generator. And um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but here's from the readme. Um, I'll let you read that for a second here. And it's, it's so good, there's actually another page, page of warnings here. I especially like the fact that the, the Planck constant wobbles a bit when I ruin the unit tests. So, so anyway, um, for what it's worth, it, it, it was a fairly good library. There were some bugs that I had to fix in it, um, and but in the end, it really didn't seem like the best thing to sort of like uh, pin like um, your entire SSL library on something that still to this day says that yeah, please don't use it. I'm not going to be reliable, liable for anything that happens. So anyway, um, Theodore Ratt and Bob Beck, two of the main OpenBSD guys, got back with me and said, hey, what if we made Open Arc for Render more portable? What if we sort of split things out? And uh, one of the things that they split out was the fact that um, whenever you have internally um, in the random number generator, you want to basically reset the, uh, the state every time you do a fork. Um, well, OpenBSD has something called map inherit zero, which basically means you can mark memory as every time you fork, this memory gets automatically just reset by the kernel back to, to null. Um, well, uh, a lot of OSs don't have that, Linux being one, and uh, a lot of, you know, just basically that's kind of a problem. Um, so we added some code to uh, naively check, um, hey, did our PID change every time we check to see if we should stir the random number generator? Um, this sort of worked to an extent, although um, right after this, uh, Ars Technica published a, a big piece about just released LibreSSL, completely invulner or vulnerable. I wish it was invulnerable. Um, and the, the idea here was that you could write a special program where you can keep forking until you make the entire um, uh, PID space wrap around um, back to make, basically making your grandchild um, the same PID as the grandparent. And uh, it's kind of a weird corner case, but, uh, but basically you were able to get two processes that had the same PID enough so that you, they ended up with the same PRNG state. So no bueno. Um, there are, I'll talk a little about this a little in, a, in a little bit more, but uh, that's actually still an still a ongoing problem with Linux. We fixed the problem somewhat, but um, without a, a, just like a kernel level API, it's, just, it's still a very hard problem to solve to, to really know that when you fork, do you get a, a same piece of memory state that's, that's cleared from the previous uh, OS or previous process. Um, something else that was added to Arc for Random, though, on the other hand, was, um, was this idea of this function called get entropy. Uh, previously, uh, Arc for Random relied on what's called a sysctl, which is kind of a BSDism. It's kind of a, you know, if you've ever done like an ioctl, um, you know, they're, they're not very um, type safe uh, interfaces. And you just kind of like have a void star. You have like a, it's, it's, it's not an interface that Linux likes. Uh, in fact, if you ever call a sysctl from Linux, it will, it will yell at you and put something in the D message output that says, Warning, deprecated interface is being used. Stop using sysctls. Um, a lot of the um, other, some of the other architectures within Linux don't even support sysctls. Um, so we don't want to have to rely on sysctls to have a, a reliable way to get entropy. Um, so anyway, we basically created this function called get entropy. It's very simple, right? It gives you some bytes. And it gives you up to 256 bytes because it's intended to be a random seed. It's not intended to be a random number generator. It's just a seed for one that you run in user space. And this is the entire man page. Um, you can see here, there's only two, two errors you can f pass. One is you gave like a null and it'll say, hey, you dummy, you, you gave me something that I can't actually write to. And another one is if you basically put a bad parameter in. Um, there's, that's, all, that's all there is to it. 
So the idea here is that any OS that wants to implement a secure ARC4 random, it won't get entropy and you are done. Easy peasy. Um, so one of the first places we did was we actually started talking to on Linux. We talked to uh, Ted So and said, hey, could you please um, add get entropy to Linux? Um, it'd be really simple and uh, I think uh, it'd be a really good benefit. This is maybe a, an eighth of the man page that ended up being written. Um, rather than adding get entropy, um, Linux added get random. And get random is a little bit weird in that it does two different things completely. Um, one is it's used for seeding a random number generator. But it's also used as just a way to, op to read from debu random um, without opening a file descriptor. And so there's, a, there's an extra flags field that lets you switch back and forth between do I want to read u random or random or do I want to be blocking or non-blocking. And um, you have to deal with interrupts and you have to deal with uh, calling e again. And, and there's just a whole bunch of crap that you have to deal with that you don't have to deal with with, um, with, with, uh, with get entropy. So basically, they took uh, what's more or less a foolproof function call and turned it into something that you basically have to write uh, 10, or 10 or 15 lines of code around it to, in order to handle all the possible error cases that might happen. I'm not bitter about it at all, but, um, but we ended up using, using it in, in Libris to sell to see the random num generator when it's, when it's available. But uh, I really think they could have done better in that, that regard and just stayed simpler. Um, and this is another place actually where Windows was kind of ahead of the curve. They've had the ability to, uh, to acquire random number generator context for a while. And in fact, uh, uh, Theo, when Theo was putting together um, uh, Get Entropy, he said, you know, I, I wish I'd known Windows was so, so, so advanced, I'd, never, I'd use it all the time. No, he didn't really say that. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it was, it was kind of funny that, that Windows has had this all along or something similar. Um, so uh, as a result of this, we kind of have to write Get Entropies for every single OS that we want to port to. And you might see here some OSs that actually already have ARC for random, like FreeBSD, OSX. One of the reasons why we have those is because we found that their built-in arc for randoms are broken, and they've been broken for a long time, and they continue to be broken. So we actually have sort of backups um, built into uh, built into LibreSSL, and we, we will blacklist people's implementations if it turns out they don't even pass the unit tests. Um, so, and again, I'll talk a little bit about forking. Um, shared state, we always want to make sure that we don't accidentally share it between forks because you can end up with two processes that, that one process that knows about another process's um, uh, shared state. So for instance, if you can trick something into doing a system call and calling another forking a, fu a function of your choosing, that function could potentially then take a know what the, uh, the shared state of the, um, of the, uh, of the, the calling process was and, and uh, get an idea of what's, what's inside the, uh, the stream. Um, one of the things that Free OpenBSD does is it has this minherit call, which lets you basically say, I don't want to, whenever I inherit a piece of memory, I don't want to um, know what's in it. I want you to zero it out automatically. And uh, right now, uh, earlier I showed you um, part of the, the Linux code that, that we had back in 2014. In 2016, you can see it's grown a few more things where we, we check to see if it's forked. We do a, a registration with the at fork command. Um, we check for PID zero. Now we also check for PID one because you can call clone. You can create um, arbitrary process spaces. Like for instance, Docker uses this to create new um, process spaces. So you can actually have multiple PID ones on a Linux box simultaneously. Um, it's kind of a pain, and I really think that until uh, they come up with a, a, a proper way to just you know make it foolproof, um, this is going to be a hairy, hairy code. Um, so Arc4 Random being 20 years old, other OSs have made progress. Solaris 11.2, Illumos, SmartOS, Android, um, Android, uh, and NetBSD 7.0 have all updated their Arc4 Random implementations in the last two years. And they now um, LibreSSL, because it auto detects if you are running these OSs, um, will automatically use them if, if they're available. So it's kind of a neat thing. Um, also, uh, other software is starting to use it because we basically put the shims in a single tree. Other people were able to pull it in. Even libbsd, that, that original fork that I, I created um, that had this, this terrible arc for random implementation, uh, just uh, a few months back, they actually pulled in the stuff from LibreSSL and OpenBSD. So it's kind of cool that ha to have that same code sort of getting pulled out. Of course, the big problem with that is um, because now they're, they're embedded, it means that if there ever needs to be an update, we find that, you know, um, in fact, actually arc for random doesn't use arc four at all. It uses, uses um, cha cha 20 now as it's um, PRNG. Um, it's hard to sort of get, get, the, get the world to sort of update um, after, after um, when there's a whole bunch of embedded versions. So it's m much better for it to be in the OS if you can. Um, and again, talking about some of the other bugs that we found in other OSs, OSX, um, 
actually solved the whole reseed on fork problem. They have a, a kernel, um, like a process extension that lets you do them too. But the reason why they fixed it wasn't because they were trying to be more secure. It's because uh, someone said there was a bug running like a Python game and that their game kept, like, they had, like the, the two players were getting like the same seed or something like that. So, uh, so they fixed this, uh, this sort of security problem by, by fixing like a game. Um, you, you, if you search around, it's a little bit hard to find um, Apple's like bug, bug reports, but uh, if you search around, you can, you can still find it um, on the interwebs. Um, but it also has this whole weak seeding problem where um, if, you, if you follow that source, you can find that actually they copied FreeBSD's version, um, and they still do as, as, of, as of today. And then FreeBSD not only can't detect forks, but it also has weak seeding as well, and I double-checked it's still broken. Um, and um, finally, uh, as sort of a, a a possible way to like solve all these uh, random art for randoms out there in the world. Um, uh, Ted Onangst put out a uh, um, with the Austin Group a uh, POSIX sort of call. I almost would call it like an RFC to basically add art for random to the um, you know the, to the POSIX standard. And unfortunately, for the last two years, people have just been basically um, adding more and more features to it and adding more ways for it to fail and all that kind of stuff. So it's stuck in committee, and uh, I don't know if it'll ever become a law. But anyway, there you go. Um, see, it looks like I've got four more minutes left, um, according to the clock, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so something else that's kind of interesting is that OpenSSL has had this, this concept of um, being tunable with, um, with environment variables. And it's very important that if you have something as, as, as important as like uh, an SSL library, that you can't set an environment variable and like change where your um, certificate path is, uh, or something like that, something that you trust when you have something like a set UID binary. Um, you want to make sure that a, an arbitrary user can't like change the way a binary works just by setting environment variables. Um, so uh, basically, LibreSSL um, used use the function that OpenBSD pioneered called isSetUGID, and the idea here is to just be able to detect this 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 scenario where if you have a, a a process that didn't start privileges but gained privileges, it suddenly becomes tainted. There should be a flag that gets set in the process. And um, UID GID changes apply to OpenBSD, but uh, anything that, that changes your privileges, like if you're um, like in, in Linux, if you get um, you know a, 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 oh, I forget what they're called, um, but there's there's another sort of privilege level that's built into a process. If you get any kind of those things changed, then you should set a flag and you should be able to keep track of it. And it works pretty well on BSDs and OSX. Um, uh, but this is how OpenSSL implemented it. Um, the big problem with this is that it, for instance, didn't take take into it, uh, account the other ways that you can get privileges within, like, say, Linux. Um, uh, also, the problem here is you have a, a time of check, time of use sort of problem, where um, you can actually change UID, EUID arbitrarily, so it doesn't stick, and uh, there can also be races between doing these different calls. Um, but there is a way in Linux to figure it out. You look at your auxiliary vector, you look at the AT secure um, offset, and you, you, know, you got it. The kernel's not telling you are you secure or not. Um, if you have a one, it's good. If you have a zero, it's bad. Um, so the big problem with get aux val, which is built into glibc, is it also returns zero on failure. Um, so so and zero is also a valid value for AT secure. So basically, if you, if you fail, you, you fail open. And so it assumes that you're not in a secure mode, even if you just had an error, um, which is kind of a, a non-starter. Um, but if you switch to glibc219, at least you get error no set. Um, so you can check that, and you can do kind of this crazy song and dance and, and maybe get something that works. Um, so it's like, mm, well, I know glibc has secure get env, which is supposed to like solve all these problems for us. Is it any better? Uh, the answer is no, it's not, because it still has these weird fallbacks that um, they don't really trust themselves. Also, all, the, all these variables here are exported symbols. So you can actually change them. Um, you can change secure on the fly, um, which kind of sucks. Um, so anyway, um, I did actually get a patch into, to muscle um, to, to do the same kind of thing. They have a non-exported symbol. And uh, here's their entire is set UGID implementation. So if you ever need to use it, use muscle libc. They actually have one. Theo said he'd buy me six pack of beer if I got this into any Linux libc. And so here was my contribution. Really cool. Um, he never did it though. Um, anyway, uh, another funny bug that I found while I was investing in this is that FreeBSD's Linux emulation um, always assumes that you are in the uh, everything's cool mode, even if uh, you're on a set UID binary. Um, and they, they actually did this for, for to make pthreads run faster. Um, and so it means that up until about two months ago, um, if you were running Docker containers or anything else in FreeBSD, um, you were basically hosed in this way. I reported it two years ago, and only as a result of this talk that I found out it was fixed, I happened to just be looking at source code. It's like, oh, look, there's an advisory, and hey, it's got my name on it. Hey, really fun. So, um, so anyway, just be careful out there, buds. 
Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, I found a lot of bugs. Um, also found that um, Solaris 11.1 and OSX don't track the set UID function past a fork. So as soon as you fork, everything looks cool again, uh, which is not good. Turns out HP UX was great. We actually implemented a set UGID and um, it, it worked fine. They actually had a, a flag that sticks. Um, and AIX was completely awful. Um, they have a zillion different ways for a process to gain privileges. They're all kind of orthogonal to each other. And um, you just had to check so many things that you'd never know if you actually got it right. Um, so in the end, we blacklisted all the broken OSs. And so it basically meant that most of the OSs that we ported um, uh, LibreSSL to um, basically never read environment variables. And nobody seemed to care. So we just deleted the whole functionality from, from the library, which was uh, probably a good thing. Uh, since I'm running a long time, I'll, I'll talk about a few, few more things and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so I talked about earlier that we got rid of SHA out of, uh, out of uh, LibreSSL. So does anyone know what this does, this function? We're calculating the SHA on a file and we get a nice value back. Um, well, unfortunately, they both have SHA and SHA1. Um, so if you're confused by that, you're, you're probably not alone. It turns out um, uh, OpenSSL SHA means SHA0 which was a standard that got withdrawn within two weeks of its release in 2004. Um, so they basically found it was completely fundamentally flawed and it was never really a ratified standard anyway. So why is it the default, the easiest thing to type in your library? Um, we found software that actually uses this. Um, so, so yeah, kind of crappy. Um, uh, so uh, what else do we have here? Here's some other things that we've gotten rid of in LibreSSL, which is kind of, kind of good stuff. We got rid of SSL v3. We had to do a lot of patches. If you, if you follow the patches link, you can find all the places where we've um, basically patched upstream and we've, uh, our porting guys have worked with the upstream to get this stuff in. You might have, if you run the latest version of Debian or even, uh, let's say, Kali Linux, you'll find that um, it's the same kind of deal, that they've also gotten rid of SSL v3. Um, a lot of the different porting communities within the different OSs have kind of worked together to get SSL v3 to be something that you don't have to have it built into your OpenSSL library, whether it's OpenSSL or LibreSSL. Um, so there's a lot of work that was gone, done behind the scenes there, but I think it was kind of important that we got rid of SSL v3 altogether, because that really spurred a lot of this work to get, get, um, get it patched out of all the different, oh, uh, um, different uh, pieces of software. And another thing that, to note is that um, we got rid of entropy get gathering daemon a long time ago, which is basically a way to get entropy when you don't have an OS that can provide it. You basically run this little unauthenticated service and you read, read bytes from it. Uh, it's kind of cruddy and um, it's a great way to like, you know, inject things or have failure cases. Um, OpenSSL 1.1.0, which isn't quite out yet, has actually released it too. I, I'm kind of feeling a little bit um, good about it in another way in that, um, for instance, S-Tunnel, um, refused our patches to remove EGD support and um, on, on the basis that they, he doesn't like pulling patches that have LibreSSL in, in them. I think it's kind of a, a vendetta against us, but um, uh, it's kind of funny because he's going to have to pull our patches in anyway, um, which is good. Um, another fun thing is that Nagios, we found, was using um, hard-coded 512-bit Diffie-Hellman keys, which basically, um, compared to like RSA, are like 256-bit Diffie-Hellman keys. Um, so not a good thing for like all of your uh, you know, management and uh, diagnosis software to be using um, to encrypt data across your data center. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we fixed that in Nagios as well. Um, another fun thing is a lot of people use OpenSSL S Client. Does anyone use S Client for testing and like, oh, I want to see if I can connect this website? Well. It's, it's a fun tool, except it has some fun quirks as well. Like for instance, if you press the R character, it renegotiates your SSL connection. Um, there's a lot of little tweaks in there. It's really meant to be a test tool, not like a, I want to transfer files with this tool. So um, if you haven't noticed it before, you, you might have been just baffled like, hmm, why is my file a little bit corrupted? Or why is this not doing exactly what I want? Um, we actually now bundle Netcat, which has full um, SSL client and server support with LibreSSL. I hear here twofold. One, to be a nice handy tool. Um, but another thing is that um, a lot of people have used OpenSSL as like the reference code for like, how do I write a client? I'll just open up SS, OpenSSL sclient.c and see how it's done. But it's a terrible, terrible thing to look at as far as how should I program um, OpenSSL. E even by OpenSSL standards, it's not, it's not a good tool because it's really just meant to just be a Swiss Army knife. It sets every single possible value. Um, it's, it's not a good example of how to do um, event-based programming or socket-based programming or anything like that. Um, but we basically worked in Netcat so that it uses the libtls API. It's very clean, compact. You can do certificate pinning. Basically, every feature we have in libtls is exposed in Netcat. So it's kind of our, our canonical example. Um, so here's some challenges we've got with LibreSSL moving forward. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, OpenSSL keeps adding 
crap to their API, which is good, I guess. Um, it's nice to see you know, things like elliptical curves getting a lot more uh, functionality and that kind of stuff. But we find that people start using this and go, well, well can't we just add this to LibreSSL immediately? And it's not always uh, good to add new APIs. That's kind of like how Heartbleed, for instance, got started, was because this sort of weakness against um, uh, this, this inability to push back against um, new APIs and new functionality for, that maybe doesn't add much of a security benefit. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of an ongoing problem we've got as far as getting this kind of stuff in. Um, another thing is uh, that pushing the software ecosystem forward takes a while. It's taking us two years to get some of these like, just basic C functions into people's operating systems, which is still really important, and it's something we're pushing towards. But even things like Linux, we've got a ton of things that still haven't really been added to Linux, and people still talk about, like, when are we going to add Arc4 Random? Um, to glibc or muscle or anything like that. And it's just, it just hasn't been happening, and it just takes time. And um, we actually don't have anyone full-time working on LibreSSL. Everyone sort of works on it in their spare time. Um, there are some people who work on it for a company or something like that, but they're not people who, um, who are necessarily contributing things back to us. Um, again, BST license, do whatever you want with it. Um, fork it however you want, and that's kind of the way it goes. Um, let's see. How to get involved. Um, so basically, start writing patches. Start writing tests. Test it out. See if it works for you. Uh, expect people to tell you your patches are crappy. My first patches, um, basically, they were just like, fix, tweak a thing. And it's like, why are you even touching this file? What are the responses? So it's kind of like, oh, I don't know. We want to delete this file? Yeah, that's better. So expect rejection. Um, send a patch to the tech at openbc.com. Um, see what happens. The, the guys really are nice. They just kind of try, try, to, try to weed out people who can't accept criticism. So, so don't take it too personally. Um, Theodore Rat's actually a nice guy in person. So, um, well, sometimes. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, try out things. Uh, let us know how you like it and support us publicly. So uh, thank you, everybody.